Welcome to Secure the Continent with me, Benga Aborawa. This is the program where we bring you up to date with all the security happenings on the continent. Before we delve into today's topic, let me bring you the latest security headlines in Africa. France stationing more forces in Niger and Chad in fight against terrorist groups. The owner of South African Tavern, where 21 teenagers died, has been arrested. An Ivory Coast has asked Mali to release 49 soldiers arrested in the Malian capital, Bamako. And more than 100 illegal immigrants are held at the Moroccan border. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back after this break. On the 5th of July 2022, the Boko Haram breakaway faction Islamic State of West Africa province, ISWAP, led a successful attack on a well-secured prison in Niger's capital, Abuja. The group shot its way into the Kujé Medium Security Custodial Center after overpowering security guards in a well-coordinated assault. The attack came hours after President Muhammad Buhari's convoy was targeted by bandits in his home state of Katsina less than a week before. Attackers invaded a mine site, killing about 40 security personnel and abducting four Chinese nationals. And a month ago, unknown shooters killed 40 worshippers in a church in Ondo State, Nigeria. We have more details for you in this package. In an almost theatrical fashion, tragedy struck at the Kujain Medium Security Custodial Center, one of Nigeria's biggest prisons, on the 5th of July. The Nigerian Minister of Defense, Bashir Magashi, revealed the next day that every member of dreaded terrorist group, Boko Haram, was released in the attack. More than 800 prisoners were freed, and more than half of them, according to the Nigerian government, have been recaptured. No escaping member of the Boko Haram terror group has been rearrested. This incursion into a massively guarded government setting has further dampened the morale of the average Nigerian as to the level of security of the common man. Government institutions are broken with ease, citizens are threatened, attacked and leave in fear and the country's security is in the doldrums. On the 28th of March, an Abuja Kaduna train was attacked by terrorists with dozens killed, many injured and hundreds abducted. While some of the victims have been released by terrorists, the fate of the rest hangs in the balance, like the fate of every other Nigerian today. Joining me to discuss this and more, we have Patrick Agbambu, President and CEO of Security Watch Africa Initiatives, who joins in live from Enugu, the eastern part of Nigeria. We also have Obigwe Gwegu, a policy analyst at Development Reimagined, joins in from Nigeria's capital city, Abuja. And Femi Arotoku Ale, a security consultant, who joins in from London in England. Gentlemen, welcome to Secure the Continent. And thank you for having me, being uh, and thanks um, for others joining us as well. I would like to start uh, with Vigwe. Now, Vigwe, the government said 879 detainees escaped, including all 68 imprisoned Boko Haram members. About half of the escapees were recaptured, and uh, one confirmed to be from the violent extremist group. Uh, now, the attack has been claimed by ISIL, and yet local media are saying it's Boko Haram. Can you please discuss how this group's uh, playing out and what are the intricacies? Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I think uh, both sides are correct in the sense that uh, ISWAP is actually one of the you know, factions of Boko Haram. If you recall, Boko Haram has been violent since uh, about uh, the late 2000s, right? And then there was the first uh, break, breakaway faction, which was Ansaru. Uh, I think that was around 2012. And then much la uh, later, there was another breakaway faction that we now call uh, Islamic State West Africa Province, um, ISWAP. So it, it, in, in a sense, 
all, all we now have three one demon with three in three heads. So the, mm. the classic Boko Haram, and then Ansaru, and then uh, you know, what, what we call Ice Swap. So uh, every every side, whether you call it Boko Haram or Ice Swap, you're actually correct. But I think it's very crucial to make the distinction uh, between the two factions. That's the, Bo the classical Boko Haram faction, which Abubakar Shekau led up until his death, and what the ice, the uh, ice swap we have today, in the sense that uh, because of certain progress that has been made on, with, on this part of the Nigerian army with regards to Boko Haram, uh, it, it needs certain context because Abubakar, Abubakar Shekau's death was as a result of factional disagreement and war between ice uh, swap and boko haram so we have to understand that boko haram might be decimated in many ways but it actually did not lose to the nigerian i mean it, it in reality it did lose to a more stronger faction so uh, when we look at the threats today posed by these three uh, sub factions i think the most you know significant threat really comes from ice swap uh, thank you Ovigwe. i'd like to bring in a uh, femi now, Femi, Nigeria is synonymous with jailbreaks and have become more rampant in recent years, but this is the first time uh, that the federal capital territory, Abuja, has been targeted. Kuje is said to be one of Nigeria's most secure prisons. How is ISWAP able to carry out uh, this latest attack? And uh, is there any significance to the timing? Um, thank you, Benga, for having me once again. And good evening, Nigerians, from home and abroad. I think one thing we should understand is that we have what we call a security field SOP in our security architecture in Nigeria. And once we're able to recognize that, then that will be the very first step in leading us to how do we correct this and what do we need to do? How do we put a very good, robust um, um, situation in place that will make things like this not to happen? Well, however, do we have the, um, what, what, we, what we call, um, the, the lead role of people that will make it happen? The answer to that is known to Nigerian and to Nigerian leaders to decide, especially when, we come, when it comes to the issue of um, interior security in Nigeria, which is the internal security. I think in so many ways, we've not been able to practice exactly what we're meant to preach, and this has led to a whole lot of security failures in Nigeria that we have today. Uh, thank you, Femi. I'd like to bring in uh Patrick from Enugu. Hi, good evening, Patrick. Are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. Now, Patrick, incessant jail breaks across Nigeria have seen more than 3,000 inmates. That's quite a large number, freed since the start of 2021. Why is it so rampant, and what is the cost of these jail breaks? Yeah, thank you. Um, but I think I need to begin by first of all saying that. Um, um, the analysis about um, uh, Boko Haram, Israel, and Ansaru uh, is not totally correct. Uh, these are two different extinct uh, zero groups um, that are fighting uh, for different purposes. Um, uh, none of them is in a faction of each other, but rather you have some factions within each particular each particular group, and that is uh, quite the definitive. Uh, then secondly, the <laughs> the killing of uh, Abu Bakr Shakao, uh, whether it's by his or by Boko Haram, which he, he was at that time leading, is not um, something that we should say whether the Nigerian army lost or uh, didn't win, win, the, win it. I think rather, um, it's not Nigerian army, but for the terrorists, I think we should rather look at it from the Nigeria as the sovereign entity against these terrorists. Um, and uh, just the Nigerian army represents, the, not just the Nigerian army, the Nigerian Armed Forces, because the, the Nigerian Air Force is also part of the fight, represents a larger entity of Nigerians. So uh, that is what we should actually get on the hand. Uh, then, uh, for the question, uh, it's quite unfortunate that we're having this issue, what I would rather call um, jail, uh, prison attacks rather than uh, jailbreaks. Uh, jailbreaks, they use usually. Uh, are those that uh, insurrection that originates from inside the, the prison, uh, within the prison, then uh, prisoners escape. But what we have been, have been attacked um, from outside, 
that um, enable some uh, some of these inmates to escape. And that visually, this is um, a little bit what uh, has created more problem, more challenge because of uh, uh, the manner of the planning, the execution, and uh, what have you. I think that uh, the internal security arrangement of who controls what has been the major uh, problem, and that has been necessitated. Uh, the call, which I, I have added to say that um, the need to streamline who protects the Nigerian correctional facilities must be defined. Uh, the Nigerian correctional services has armed, armed group, armed group uh, but uh, they are not actually enough and they are not well equipped. But, um, then you look for support from the Nigerian. Uh, Security and Civil Defense Corps, the NSCDC, also support from the Nigeria Police Corps uh, to support. And yet, this support are more than repairer, um, which makes the uh, response to be a little bit uh, slower. And I think there's need, uh, uh, there's need to actually work as a system within the, uh, the government system, in the Office of the National Security Advisor, to be able to coordinate properly. Yes, I know that there are some administrative challenges because um, uh, the, the correctional services and the civil defense are in one ministry, while Nigerian police force is in yes. another ministry. That has made the coordination a little bit uh, difficult. But I think in this situation we are now, uh, there is need to form a unified or a joint uh, force that will be able to protect uh, these uh, facilities. Thank you very what much, uh, Patrick. Uh, I'd like to bring in Avigwe here. Now, Avigwe, there's an allegation that Nigerian authorities were alerted to intelligence uh, that the Kujay prison break could happen, and they failed to act on this intelligence. In what circumstances do security services fail to act on intelligence provided on an imminent threat or attack? How true is this allegation? Yeah, well, first of all, before I uh, speak, I would like to actually, you know, sort of like speak to what uh, co panelist says here that there is no connection between the groups. Well, ISWAP was founded by Abubakar Banawi, who is, uh, uh, who is actually the son of the founder of Boko Haram. Banawi was actually a spokesperson for Boko Haram before going on to find, found ISWAP. So I don't uh, understand what you mean by. They, they are distinct. They are distinct groups. They are not distinct, you know, in, in in that sense because of the historical connection between the leaders of of this group. I can understand that maybe one might be more affiliated to Al Qaeda and the other one is more affiliated to ISWAP. So uh, the ideologies and tactical approaches might be different. But to say that they are not, uh, they are distinct group, I think that is mm. uh, summarily erroneous. Then to your question, uh, to your question about faulty intelligence or whether there was, you know, any. Uh, expectation about the um, failure of action to respond to, to intelligence. It's hard to say because, I mean, uh, no, nobody knows what, what the, uh, the police or the security intel intelligence uh, services but, know. But Ovigwe, so, ISIL yeah. worldwide, uh, I think it was around May, did call on all uh, cells and branches all over the world that there would be a renewed uh, attack and uh, uh, a policy to free uh, its imprisoned members. Don't you think uh, that that's enough reason to to uh, put the searchlight on correctional facilities and prisons? Yes, it, it is. But you have to understand that that, is, that announcement raises alarm and, of course, should uh, have necessitated a more robust protection of you know, strategic locations like prisons and where you have uh, sort of like defected uh, Boko Haram and ISWAP uh, fighters, some of those places in, in the, in the mm. north, those camps, right? However, you know, it could be any time, right? So the, its intelligence is more specific than that. So if there was an announcement, you can't, that's not operational intelligence, that's just useful information. Is when you say attack will be you, the, the Nigerian state was aware that a, said attack would take place on this particular day, on oh. this particular time, with this. Yeah, so the specificity of the information 
right? Uh, is is what uh, anybody here can 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 debate. You you can't tell because we are not in the, in the military or in police or in intelligence to so say yes they knew, yes they did not know. But uh, what you said is very important because uh, if there was a you know a worldwide declaration and it, of course that should have meant uh, extra measures should have been taken. But you also have to understand the frequency and, and the that this is routinely done. You know, as a way to tire out, you know, uh, militaries all over the world. So they, they could just say, we're going to attack on X, X Y, D, and nothing happens. And then oh, they yes. do that second time, they do that the third time. Before you know it, you, you, you know, you tend to actually not take this thing seriously. It's not as if the police and the military are not taking the attack, this threat seriously, but you have to understand the constraints that we have in our system. Somebody has mentioned security sector uh, failure. Well, most of it is because of lack of personnel. Nigeria has one, for instance, 186 policemen to what 100 to 100,000 uh, population. That is way below global average, which is 400. So when you have this type, we are stretched everywhere: north, east, northwest, uh, you know, south, uh, southeast, and then you are yeah, north central with all of these uh, theaters that they have opened up. You're not putting any more, more manpower into into the security services then you really cannot sustain like massive deployment based or, or, uh, based on this type yes. of uh, uh, announcement for a prolonged period of time because these people are extremely overworked you know in every direction we need full security sector reform to actually boost capacity you know to be able to deal with, more effectively with those type of threats and pronouncements thank you Vigwe. Um, Femi, Nigeria's interior minister, uh, Mr. Ralph Arabeshola, said Kujay prison is the most fortified in the country. He also added that they had enough men to protect the facility, but unfortunately, they couldn't hold their position effectively. My question to you is this. Have there been any resignations or dismissals since the jailbreak happened over a week ago uh, that led to over 400 inmates fleeing and what do you make of the interior minister's comments? Um, let me start from, um, before I answer the question, let's start from here. As far back as 2020 to date, we have more than, let me say, about 800 um, freed inmates or more than 800 or, you know, SKPs from our prison um, areas. Mm. Now, if the minister is saying this, I think... For the love of God, the minister too should take a very bold step and step down because he's not been functioning well in his own capacity. Why did I say that? Let us look at the body language of our welfare, I mean, of our prison um, or correctional facilities officers. How do they look? What sorts of weapons do they have? When was the last training given to them? We need a whole lot of audits before we can say, okay, let's have so many heads to roll. Mm. Because at the moment, what we do have is poor facilities for our security officers, not only the correctional facility officers, but all security officers nationwide. They are not being properly taken care of. So how do you want them to put passion, to be very passionate about the kind of job they do? Again, let us look at Kujie Prison and all other prison centers that will have all these SKPs. How many kind of changes have we seen in them? Let us look at Kujie Prison and other prisons as well. Can you tell me that those prisons are well fortified? The answer to all this are zeros. If we have security officers in all these correctional facilities, how come we're still deploying civil defense, deploying police, deploying military into all this? That means we still don't understand exactly what we're doing. We have hardened criminals in all these places, and we allow just free flow of visitors to come in. Who we'll check who? Who are they? How do we have records of those that I mean, it's said that some of these inmates right. also have access to mobile communication devices, uh, which they yes, use to that, communicate yes, with the outside things world. that we yes. need to really understand. Who is actually authorizing them to use all these stuff? So, head to find what I think the minister should do the honorable thing and leave the office because it's not fit for purpose in the first place. Thank you, Fermi. I'd like to bring in uh, Patrick. Now, Patrick, have there been any rearrest of the high-profile terrorists that escaped, and uh, what threats do they pose to security of the country? Okay, I think we lost Patrick. Uh, we'll uh, bring him back. Oh, Vigwe, would you like to answer uh, that question? Well, I think that is going to be 
you know, very difficult in the sense that uh, if you look at this sophistication of the attack uh, and how the success of the attack, you know, it means they didn't just plan to break out. There was a very elaborate plan to ensure that once they are out of the walls of Kuji prison, they are gone for good. Because the, the, for them to have the capacity to actually carry out such an attack, I mean, the planning must have been very comprehensive. So the, ch the likelihood of um, recovering the main, so yeah, you, you, you recover but, but what's the topography plus. of the area, if you can uh, give us uh, a view? Because it seems they just disappeared into thin air, almost on a post. Well, that's because uh, Kuje is in the outskirts of Abuja in, in a sense, like it's not in the, in the main city center. So we're not talking about an urban area at, at all. So if you be uh, around uh, Kuji, the Kuji prison, of course, you have vast expanse of, of, of land. The vegetation is more uh, savanna in, in, in a sense, so not like very thick, you know, uh, rainforest uh, uh, in, in, in that sense. So you could see during uh, following hours, a lot of uh, choppers, police and military helicopters flying uh, over trying to see uh, to see if they could support with you know, mm. uh, area, area surveillance. But I, like I said, because of the sophistication of these groups, uh, the planning would have been very elaborate. These are not new. These are very sophisticated criminals, like particularly the, 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 the terrorists that we have in prison. These, many of them are very well trained. And they, they actually were convicted because of the, the kind of rank that they, they, they mm -hmm. held in uh, in, in, the, in the outfits. So uh, they know how to evade because they have been on the battlefield for a very long time. So, and I think given the current situation with our weaponry and, and, facility and, uh, and uh, capacities, it might be very difficult uh, to recover them. That is not to say that the government is not taking measures. I know there's no way in the world where you would have this type of situation happen and government's not taking action. Yes. The government is taking action. There's no doubt about that. But whether the action, whether the action is complemented with enough capacity for the action to be very effective and successful, that is debatable. Now, Femi, a visibly angry President Buhari, while visiting the uh, Kujay prison, questioned the intelligence in place, the attackers' easy access to the facility, and the ability to leave without a trace. The President, Commander in Chief of the Nigerian Armed Forces, and a former army general also tweeted, and I quote, how can terrorists organize, have weapons, attack a security installation, and get away with it? My question to you, Fem, is this. Is Nigeria on the President Buhari out of security options? And is it time we seek outside help? Is it getting out of hand? I don't think um, uh, with, uh, with the present situation we have ourselves in right now in Nigeria, we do not need any outside help. Up. Rather, we have the full capacity, but we're not just channeling our energy to what we should do. Let me give you a typical example of what I'm saying. Hardened criminal in medium prison. How does that work? Let us let us have this calculation done very well. Mm. These are um, um, what you have the real Islamists, the real criminals killing people, and you have them all together in one medium prison, medium in sense, not even high profile prisoner whatsoever. We have that many prisons in Nigeria. Why not just strategically scatter them around? You didn't do that. Now, I'm going to show you some few things because what we are saying that claim responsibility for the attack happens to be um, the video being taken or being shot by one of the terrorists is from his phone. How many security officers within the facilities have got what we call the body one camera in the first place? Mm. None of them seems to have anything like this on them. So how would they be able to record incidents happening? How many drones do we have that probably maybe um, at sporadic time every day can do survey Sorry around the facility? We don't have. So with all this happening, it shouldn't be a surprise to the head of state that we're having this situation because is not even in the know of it, from my own understanding. If you are in the know of it, then this shouldn't be a surprise to you. However, as I've said, how, for how often do we do these security audits to know what they need and what they do not need and what might probably be in place? 
technology is of good advantage, but the question is, are we taking advantage of it? The answer to that is no, because most of our security officers in our facilities, in prison facilities today, are probably just like, you know, let's just have a job to do. Mm -hmm. They are not well trained to understand what they should do. Or maybe they should bring in some other ideas into it to make it work. So with all this happening, I think the president shouldn't be surprised because he's failed in terms of security and he's failed the prison correctional facilities as well in terms of all these criminals escaping. This is not the first time we have about eight different jailbreaks in Nigeria within how many years. So it's, it's alarming and we're not working towards it. And the only way we can work towards it is by having database of people coming into the prison once they're arrested, once they are being sectioned out, okay, you're going to be serving jail time they should have their database and transfer, or maybe, maybe share it amongst all security departments in the country. That is another way we can work out things. But without all this, we will just keep on talking about it and there will be no solution on ground. Okay, Femi and uh, Vigwe, who do you thoughts there? We'll go on a quick break and when we return, we'll be looking at uh, preferring solutions uh, to this incessant uh, prison breaks and terrorism in Nigeria. Do stay with us. This is Secure the Constant. Thank you for staying with us on New Central Television. This is Secure the Continent, and we've been discussing uh, Joe Breaks Terrorism and Securing Nigeria. I still have with me uh, Security Watch Initiatives um, President uh, Patrick Agwambo. We lost him earlier. I still have Ovigwe Agwegu, Policy Analyst, the Development Reimagine, and Femi Aratoko Ale, uh, Security Consultant. Uh, gentlemen, welcome back to the program. Now, Ovigwe, before we went on that break, I asked Femi uh, what he thought about the president's statement when he visited uh, Kuje uh, Correctional Facility. It really doesn't inspire confidence in the people. And uh, as Commander-in-Chief, I wonder what you make of that statement. And also, the fighting has been going on. Boko Haram started in the late uh, 2000s, around 2009. The fighting has been going on for many years. Why hasn't the government been able to get a grip on the situation? Yeah. Um, with regards to the president's statement, I think that, that came as a shock to me and many, many people because uh, he should be the one asking the questions, mm. right? Even if he's going to ask the questions mm. to his security chiefs and those in charge of the correctional service, that should be in private. He should be giving Nigerians answers because Nigerians are, will be are, are expecting him to give us answers, not questions. Right. Uh, we voted him in a way we actually employed him to solve this problem of security, to develop the country and do all of the things necessary to do that. So much has been spent in his, on, uh, under his administration re relating to security. We've bought the super tokanos from the Americans. We've bought the weapons from the Chinese. We've bought just about any, any, anything that uh, he has asked of the National Assembly. They've granted the monies mm -hmm. to him. But the results, to a very large extent, uh, does not match or hold up against the investments that Nigerians have committed you know, into, into security. So he should actually be giving us answers. Uh, but in, in a way, I can see why he, he will be asking questions, because maybe he is also you know, frustrated in, in the sense, like, mm -hmm. I've spent so much money, I've given so much yes. uh, out, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not seeing any result. But however, if we're being serious, uh, security has not really improved, if anything, that's gotten worse. Is it because in of the asymmetrical nature of this warfare, it's hit and run, and it's not your conventional uh, war, which you would say, you know, the Nigerian security operators have been used to, but it's been going on for more than 10 years, and you would feel they would have adjusted strategy and uh, found a way to deal with this counterinsurgency? It, yeah. I, I, I like the fact that you, you made, you made uh, that point because when Boko Haram started in 2009, or the attacks started coming in 2009, they took on this guerrilla hit and run uh, tactic. It, it was very difficult, very challenging for the Nigerian security, security apparatus to, to, re, to react to because they lacked complete you know, understanding of this type of you know, uh, warfare. However, this is 2022. We are well into the second decade 
of this of this um, war against terrorism, you would and given the amount of money spent, mm -hmm. you would expect that by now we've been able to build capacity to actually combat the, uh, this threat effectively. In in a sense, uh, what they've been able to successfully do to a large extent has been to reclaim some of the territories that they've, they've lost because that kind of territorial uh, warfare is where the military has capacity or experience. You know, traditional mm. military is you stand there, I stand there, you hold territory, I hold territory, and then we'll see who will get the most territory at the end of the day. So even if we're still struggling with that, at least that is the only area where we've seen real uh, progress. But in terms of body counts, and that that they, they, they've been a decline, but the decline has flattened off, you know, because 2013, 2014 in particular, 20, 2013, 14, really, uh, even from 2012, there was really spike in, you know, casualties mm -hmm. because today we have 30,000 people dead. Most of those deaths actually, have actually, were actually in the early to mid-2010. So even if there, there's been a decrease in a sense, but it's not, it's still so high that is problematic. And there really needs to be a very comprehensive re we look at our you know our strategies and uh, to ensure that you know we are able to build you know uh, capacity and have the right weapons because mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, competence plus weapons equals capabilities and our capabilities f f fall well short of where they need to be to be able to deal with this type of you know warfare that we're facing. Exactly, and they haven't been able to degrade uh, Boko Haram and ISWERB's capability to carry out dangerous attacks. Now, Femi, uh, there's been a growing suggestion. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that one of the reasons uh, Boko Haram and other armed groups are so successful is that there are people in the security services and governments who are sympathetic uh, to the group. Do you think this is a conspiracy theory, or uh, there's some element of truth to it? Um, you see, uh, we've always had people sympathetic to our security um, failures, and we've always seen, you know, people, you know, sympathetic to all these criminals. Because if we call them Boko Haram or you call them terrorists, as if we're glorifying them. But all I can say to all this is this: the moment we are ready to tackle this issue, then we will need to tackle it heads on. But if we cannot tackle this issue heads on, then that means we still see it as business as usual every day. Because the only way out of this mess we find ourselves in Nigeria is this, just like my colleague said over there, money has been spent, investment done, but have we been able to invite or spend money on brilliant people to come around, not only the military, not only the police, to see how better ways we can you know, marginalize things together and work it out? The answer to that is no, we've not been able to do that. So we will keep on having this mess and, you know, dirty games being played and, you know, some people glorifying them and some people being sympathizing with them, telling them, oh, they are young boys, they are this, they are that. We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't do that. How fast sentences should be seen and most possibly, you know, real sentences should be seen as in once you've done something wrong, let us have it back to you that way. It should be mm -hmm. back to back. But what we're having is we have leniency everywhere. We have ideas not even working in Nigeria and is working against the people instead of working against the terrorists or the criminals that we have in the country. Thank you, Femi. Now, Vigwe, you're a resident of the Federal Capital Territory, and a lot of Nigerians, especially residents of Abuja, uh, concerned about the relative ease at which uh, the attack at the Kuje uh, prison was carried out with little or no resistance from the security agencies. How worried are you that this could be the prelude to something larger and it might inspire uh, copycat attacks? Yeah, well, for the peers I spend here in, in Abuja, I, I, I will tell you uh, it, it's because I travel in and out quite, uh, mm -hmm. of the city quite a lot. But what I'm, I'm, I have to say with regards to my perception of security is since the jailbreak, of course, you can sense in the air there's some form of anxiety, right? So you see more, there's more police presence, most, more military presence in some strategic places. And that is, that, that is clearly a sign that the, even the security apparatus is concerned about a possible attack you know, uh, being, being carried out. However, let's not be, let's not be too, uh, too fixated on the capital's territory every single day. 
everywhere in this country, particularly in the northeast, in the north northwest, Nigerians who are not less important than Nigerians in Abuja. Mm -hmm. I don't care where they are in Abuja, whether it's in Asu Rock or in you know in the important uh, Maitama and likes. Every citizen is equally important and equally entitled to the same level of security that anybody you know, enjoys in, in this in this country. So, whether Abuja is concerned or, or people residents of Abuja are concerned for their rights, so they can begin to imagine what people outside of the capital city are experiencing. This is their everyday reality, and it's even worse. So, for for the times I've been spoken on this this issue, and there's this so much hysteria around, oh, Abuja, Abuja. Yes, I understand it's a capital territory. You really want to keep it safe because of expatriates, because of it is a seat of power. You want a lot of stability around that. But the people here are no more important than people everywhere, everywhere else in the country. So we really shouldn't be having that, that conversation uh, as if it's, uh, it's, it's normal. It's very abnormal because mm. everybody deserves security and we should have a proper rethink on how we're going to ensure that security is available and protection of life and property is afforded to every Nigerian, no matter where they are in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Absolutely. Now, Femi, what needs to be done to safeguard our prisons and correctional facilities in Nigeria at the bare minimum? So what should be done, I think, at the bare minimum is this. Let us, you know, um, restructure the offices. Let us restructure, uh, you know, um, security architecture in terms of the kind of weapons they have, if these are cake weapons, get them new weapons, retrain them and provide proper welfare for them. At least for once, listen to them and let us hear from them first what exactly could be done better rather than we or the government enforcing policies on them. I think they have a better... Okay, I believe we have some uh, connection issues uh, with... Um with Femi in London. Now, Vigwe, what needs to be done uh, to secure our correctional facilities and prisons? So one of the things I think we, we, we can do immediately that will have a lot of impact is to reduce the attractiveness of these places for these terrorist groups. So for instance, mm. if you concentrate a lot of their members in a particular prison, I think Femi was speaking to that earlier. True. Of course, you automatically make that place prime target for them because they want to get their bosses out, they want to get their, some of them are actually relatives, some of them are very good you know, friends, get them out of those places. So what, what, like Femi said, we should have a situation where uh, either you are keeping them off site or, or, I mean, the Americans had Guantanamo Bay, it's a very ridiculous place, it's very controversial, but it, you do that when you really want to minimize uh, the risk of, of, of attacks. You know, create in, in a prison. fortress. Yes. You, either you create special prisons for them or you, you, you best want to really spread them thinly across. But the problem with that is we don't even have enough prisons in Nigeria with, with the security in the, uh, uh, capacity to actually hold high-profile criminals. Maybe we can make Kuji, there's Kiri Kiri. Uh, there's another one in, in Niger, I think. But um, we've not built new prisons. So that, that's one, one of even the mm -hmm. problems with our counterterrorism strategy. We've not even... We've not gotten to the point where we are actually prepared to deal with the the, the litigation or the adjudication and, and the rehabilitation parts of it. So if you look at the camps, even keeping the defectors, not so good, right? Not, not, many mm -hmm. of them are actually not very well secured. Look at the place, the, the, the prisons who are keeping the uh, those who have been who have been convicted or are waiting trial. Not very secure, medium security prison because the facility, even the, the housing facilities for counterterrorism, that component is seriously lacking from our in, uh, uh, from our counterterrorism strategy, and I think that needs to be corrected as soon as possible so that we minimize the you know the, the attractiveness of these places you know uh, for the, the terror organization. I think that's a very easy place to start. And then, of mm. course, there are many other things like training and retraining of uh, of, of, of uh, national correctional uh, Nigeria correctional services personnel that are stationed in prisons that hold, you know, terrorists or you know, uh, this this type this type of uh, criminals. So I think that that those are like two immediate things that we can actually do. But of course, there are more long-term uh, solutions that the government needs to think about. 
Thank you, Vigwe. And uh, Femi, just before we begin to wrap things up, how has this decade of violence, uh, more than a decade of uh, violence in Nigeria, affected communities, particularly families, the infrastructure, health services, education, and so on? Well, it's, it's really having a serious impact because right now, a lot what do we do? How do we see ourselves as safe of people in Nigeria today? And the answer to that is that uh, no one is safe. So this will definitely make people to start thinking otherwise, maybe to relocate or to... We think, asking themselves one question, what do we need to do to make sure Nigeria mm. is safe? I think the first thing they need to do is this, start looking into how to secure lives and property. Okay, thank you, Femi. And uh, Vigwe, just before we wrap things up, there are 27 ministries, departments, and agencies involved in security in Nigeria. We also have a national counterterrorism strategy that has defined roles for all the aforementioned agencies. So why is Nigeria still struggling to deal with insecurity? And what do Nigerian military and security planners need to do to start to turn the tide against these insurgents? I think they are, um, see, strategy, strategizing is very easy. Like you could just sit down, mm. write, <laughs> think things through ideation and then put very fancy and sometimes really brilliant work on paper, right? But it's not the paper that is going to actually do it. You need to be operationalized and people have to do, yeah, people have to do the implementation of the strategy. And I tell you, that is really where we have a lot of problems. It's not that we don't have brilliant people at home and abroad or even currently in service that can solve this problem. I can, I, I can, I can look at Nigeria and never see talent and expertise is something that we lack. It's just not the case. It is the implementation. Because in, with implementation, that's where you now have structural issues like corruption, coordination, right? And then monitoring and, and evaluating the impact of mm. this strategy and even reassessment of the strategy to see to, to, to take you know uh, into uh, into a cognizance what needs to be adjusted and that, that's that those three for me are like core core problems that we are facing corruption the current national security advisor is on record saying mon some some several billions were committed to security are unaccounted for just think about what that means. You know, this national security advisor saying something like that. It shows you that so many of the uh, the funds made available for counterterrorism actually do not make it to uh, you know to the, the the budgeting or even even if it's budgeted for is is it was mm. diverted you know uh, and not not used for for what it was intended uh, uh, for. And that that means the what Buhari, for instance, thinks he has spent on terrorism. Uh, what it's Nigerians not. think they spent on terrorism, that's really not what they spent on terrorism. So that is a problem. And it so does have real issue, effects on the situation on the ground, exactly. Uh, of course yes. it does, the morale and all of that. And because some of these people in the militaries, they know, they might not be high up enough to complain, but they know that more, they should get in more from the government mm. based on what they've see, read in papers and they know that what uh, was uh, allocated to, to them for welfare, and for you know for the, for the fight, so that the the moral issue, of course, is definitely tied to, to welfare and, and corruption. And then we really need to deal these three issues: corruption, coordination, and then really okay. readjustment of our strategies. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for your time and contribution to the program. Patrick Agbambu, Vigwe Gregu, and Femi Aratoku Ale. Thank you very much for joining us and secure the continent. Now, Nigerian government and the international community needs to cut off the sources of contact of Boko Haram, the popular support of Boko Haram in form of manpower, material fund, intelligence, arms and ammunitions at the domestic and international levels must be cut off. In the same vein, the issue of unemployment needs to be addressed. Also, governments should ensure effective use of resources like power, military, land reforms, finance, external alliances and hierarchical structure of organisations to counter insurgents. Lastly, there must be strict enforcement of law against any act of terrorism and insurgency. Until next time, remember to stay with us on Secure the Continent. I am Benga Aboroa. Thanks for being a part of the programme.